cloud. Okay, so today's speaker is uh, Lucas La Casa, um, who is uh, well known at IFISC. So for many of you, you don't, uh, Lucas doesn't require an introduction, but I'll briefly say a bit anyway. So Lucas got his PhD at the Technical University in Madrid in, in 2009, and then was a postdoc at IFISC um, in, in 2010. Um, and then went again back to Madrid uh, for a few years as assistant professor. And since 2013, He's been at the Queen Mary University of London um, in the mathematics department. Um, and uh, among other things, has, has held an EPSRC um, Early Career Fellowship, a very prestigious award in the, in the UK. And he's currently there a reader. And he's also a visiting researcher at EFISC and in fact, currently in Palma. Um, so if you want to talk to him after the talk. So the title for today is Complex Systems and COVID-19. The screen is yours. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Tobias. Thanks for inviting me. Um, and thanks everybody for, for coming uh, to see the talk. So this talk um, is entitled Complex Systems and COVID-19, three practical cases on how, how science made or didn't make its way into policy. Um, so maybe I should put an introduction, uh, sorry, uh, um, a motivation because this is not going to be a standard academic talk in the sense that of presenting some new theoretical results that have been published recently in a paper, but it's more about uh, an account of a few works that have been involved over the last year. And um, I, I thought that this would be uh, an interesting talk maybe for, for some of you that might be interested in, in seeing how, how how and how difficult sometimes it is that science can be um, really applied and, and turn into policy making. Um, so my approach within COVID was, uh, within the pandemic was along the lines of how can we help? Uh, I, I hesitated at the beginning as many of us because there's a standard approach that to the pandemic, which was essentially along the lines of leaf virologists and public health experts solve this on their own. And I think, uh, at least in my opinion, is that um, this attitude was wrong. And I really think that complex systems as a, as a community and as a field could provide a clean eye and, and, and provide something, some kind of uh, way of thinking that was not present in, in experts in public health, and et cetera. So, so we provide a complementary angle that could, could be useful uh, to tackle different scientific problems um, within the pandemic, not only as a research field like epidemiology, but also uh, within the pandemic. And also uh, for me, at least it was a kind of challenging change of focus for once, I'm, I'm a theoretician, so it was also a good opportunity to, to sw switch a little for a, for a few months from theory to very applied science. Okay, so here we go. Um, I was involved in several projects. I'm going to present three of them here today. The reason is that I'd like to discuss a bit about uh, differences that I found between uh, projects that I was sort of commissioned to do or involved within a group that was commissioned to do a project and how easy or how hard, or how hard it was to convey certain messages and turn our um, scientific uh, results into some advice which could eventually um, be useful for policymaking. And some other works we were done, let's say in a more standard fashion, essentially independently or you know, like we all do our work, uh, in, some kind of independent research and uh, yeah, and how, how difficult it was to, for these cases to be translated into, into policy. So without further ado, uh, so all three projects are different. All of them have some um, elements from complex systems uh, and all of them at least in a priori had the intention of, of being helpful, not necessarily doing new science, but using the science we know and, the, and our philosophy in complex systems to, to be able to provide some help within, within the pandemic. 
All right, so I start with project number one, household bubbles and COVID insight from percolation theory. So um, the result, I'm start, starting by the end, the result is, a, is a summarized in this paper that was published recently in a, in a special issue, uh, which uh, um, combined or summarized the so part, part, part of, of the modeling that was done in 2020 and that shaped the early COVID-19 response in the UK. Um, so basically, um, this special issue gathers uh, works from essentially people from uh, SPI-M and SPI-M uh, is, a, is a mathematical modeling group. So SPI-M stands for Scientific Pandemic Influenza Group on Modeling. Those of you that uh, either live in the UK or, or have um, an interest in that might know this very well. And SPI-M is a subgroup of SAGE, which is the scientific, um, um, scientific group that advises the cabinet in the UK. And um, so how this works is that SAGE asks questions that uh, the scientists in SPI-M tackle and work, uh, and then they, they, they respond to the questions to SAGE. The problem to solve, uh, or the problem that constituted this project number one and was asked by SAGE was the following. How should we design bubbles? And I'm gonna explain in a minute what a bubble is in such a way that the R value is not substantially affected. An important thing is that the, when Sage asks a question, they need to the answer very quickly. So it's not a standard scientific project that you have, I don't know, six months, one year, two years to, to work on. So I was involved in this because uh, both uh, Leon Dannon and uh, Ellen Brooks Pollock, well, and some others, um, are members of SPIM. Probably many of you know Leon because he's, he's been a very active member of the complex systems community himself. For the last years, he's been tending more towards uh, mathematical epidemiology, but, but definitely he's, he's, I would say, one of us, one of ours. Um, so, so um, yeah, I started to work with them on, 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 well, on, several, on several problems, including, including this one. So what's the problem in a few words? Um, so we start by what are the household bubbles, okay? So in a nutshell, uh, when you join together two households or three or four households into an exclusive unit, that's what it's called a bubble, okay? Um, then what's the point of making household, bu household bubbles? Well, there are different reasons to, to wanting to, to join household bubbles. All, I'm thinking about within the context of a, a situation such as a lockdown that we all experienced um, last year. So um, here I'm showing on the, on the right hand side of the screen, a graph that shows the standardized depressive symptom scores within a lockdown. And as you can see, um, Living alone uh, here, sorry, where is it? Yeah, living alone here stands very high. Uh, so there are several issues. So lockdown basically affects mental health, okay? And in particular, living alone one is one of the, the, the most important ones, the most important factors. Uh, so individual living alone are actually much more affected by, by lockdown, okay? And interestingly, uh, when we look at the composition of household sizes in the UK, uh, and that's the, the um, distribution of household sizes, we, we could see that many of the household sizes are just uh, single, single, single uh, individuals. Okay, so many people living alone, and if living alone is 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 a major feature. Uh, for uh, depression or for mental health problems, then then uh, trying to to you know to solve these issues is really important. So the question then that, that that was asked is that can we increase social support without massive increase in, in transmission? Okay. In particular, can we um, 
build bubbles, for instance, taking, taking these people that live alone and forming bubbles with other people such that uh, by doing that, we don't affect, for instance, the, the R value of, uh, of, the, current, of the epidemic spreading in, in, in the UK. So, um, to, well, uh, that was one option, but there could be other options. We don't, didn't really know what was the true effect of, of different bubbling scenarios. And the question that Sage asked to Spyam was, well, you need to give us a, an, a, an advice about what would be the effect of different bubbling scenarios. And we, you, you, need, you need to do this kind of quick. So what we thought was that, that percolation theory could really provide a flexible way to do that. And I mean, it's, I don't think I have to uh, explain what percolation theory is in an IFISC seminar, but just let me remind you very quickly that it is the process by which uh, if you have, for instance, a network and you start, sorry, like a bunch of nodes and you start aggregating uh, links at some point, uh, uh, what is called a giant component will emerge. So a, a, a finite fraction of all the nodes will be connected. And um, so that, that happens abruptly. There's a phase transition that separates a phase, um, subcritical phase where, where, where there's no giant component and a, a supercritical where there's a giant component. And we can use this as a proxy for whether an, an epidemic will, will spread or not. So if, if the structure of the social network is somehow closer to, the, to this than to this, then, then uh, so the, essentially the, the R value uh, will be smaller than one effectively, okay? Um, so the idea basically then was, okay, so we can do a percolation analysis uh, changing, changing the social network such that bu different bubbling scenarios will be considered. And uh, okay. that's what we did. So to repeat this, what we did was to build a simple model of UK household social network and analyze percolating properties for different bubbling con configurations. So we had access to data about the household sizes and, and such and such and therefore we could do the, the problem. So our working idea was that uh, to look at the percolation threshold uh, for, this, uh, for this system was a proxy for the transition to, to, uh, to an epidemic going forward. So basically having R larger than one. And we looked at different configurations as you can see here. This is a summary of, so, I think, I hope it's, it's clear what we did. I'm, I'm, I don't want to go into the details, but basically uh, we have the, the structure of the social network or the household network where each node is a household. Uh, and so there are nodes of different sizes and therefore um, people have contacts within like inter-household according to how big the, the, the households are. And then we check how for different ways of merging households together, like merging households, let's say, of only single individuals, so people living alone, or uh, people or living alone with any kind of household, etc. cetera, um, how the structure of the network is modified uh, in terms of uh, what's the percolation threshold of, of that network. And we found that as compared to, well, yeah, basically here is a, this is the percolation threshold. And that, that means that um, uh, if the percolation threshold is, is very large, so that means that uh, it's, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of okay um, in terms of an epidemic. If it decreases, it's very easy to, for, a, for an epidemic to transmit. Um, and we can see that there are two scenarios here, the one plus one and the one plus N, which relate to making bubbles, to providing the opportunity of, for people that live alone to make bubbles with either an, other people living alone or with people or with any other kind of household. So for these two co uh, kind of 
but in scenarios, the percolation threshold was not really much affected. And that was the basic conclusion that we got from, from that work. So then what we did was to uh, report that, um, that uh, result to SPI-M. So this is a group that, uh, so, I don't know, in SPI-M there's maybe about, I would say about 50 uh, scientists uh, from the UK, uh, basically mathematical modelers. And uh, the idea or how SPI-M uh, SPI works, uh, it, they work around redundancy and consensus. So basically once we fed these results, the analysis was replicated, although with other approaches by, by other groups. And there are other groups there, uh, so people from Imperial College and the London School, etc. So uh, results were, were replicated indeed. And then we, from that, a consensus was reached, which was then uh, reported uh, or fed back into SAGE. Okay, so the, the, the idea is that the, we didn't provide to SAGE our results, but the consensus of several works that end at replicating the same kind of um, uh, problem or study. So according to what Sage got, then they fed it up into the cabinet uh, and then policy was made. And in this case, uh, in the UK, there was this, this rule about support bubbles, which went uh, public from, I don't know, it was about May, 2020 or so. So conclusions from project number one is that uh, a simple complex system concept such as percolation well, simple, at least in, in the sense of very well known by, by complex system scientists, can be very useful in practice to make quick and flexible assessment of scenarios. So you see, it's no really something different than I would say any PhD student or, uh, uh, you know, couldn't really do. So implementing some kind of configuration model of networks and doing percolation analysis, but still it can have a practical impact. Uh, but for, the, for that to happen, you, it was clear that there was, they, they needed to have an organizational structure such as SPIM in this case, this structure had to be efficient such as this one. And, and I think it is indeed a quicker flexible modeling arm. Okay. Uh, we change gears now and... Sorry, may yeah. I interrupt you or do you prefer questions at the end? Uh, however you want, you can... No, I just wanted to, to ask, what do you mean by... So a policy was implemented, meaning that several households or solo households can interact with others, but was this related to the real structure? So, so who decided to, to which household can the the solo person to connect is, is left to him or her, her or, or is? Yes, no, yes, exactly. Um, um, the, 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 the policy was made, it was such that uh, any person living on their own can choose a bubble, can select to either uh, form a bubble with a friend or with another household, uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so there wasn't any additional structure imposed into that. And then another question, the, the structure of the network you, you start with, the network of contacts, is there, is, you have mentioned some configurational model, but is, is, a, is a model or did you use measured social structure? No, no, it's a model. Um, <clears throat> uh, at least we didn't have access to that kind of data. Um, we, we had access to statistics about uh, household sizes and, and we built uh, using configuration model, we build household networks accordingly. So we didn't impose any additional uh, criteria like specific community structure in the network or anything of that sort. It was actually quite, quite basic. And I'm not sure if other um, groups, uh, probably they, they, they made more sophisticated models, either, either realistic models of uh, real social structure or, or at least, I don't know, maybe generative models, but with, with, more, with more structure. Uh, um, but essentially 
there is, I think the, the essentially the, 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 what we got is that the results were qualitatively similar, meaning that um, people living alone, if they bubble with someone else, um, this doesn't have a, a measurable impact in practice on the R value of the whole country. Okay, so let's switch uh, gears now and I'm presenting our project number two. This was a project uh, I was involved um, on the design and validation of the Spanish digital contact tracing app, Radar COVID. And the results of my, of the part I was involved, it was developing and uh, yeah, designing and measuring this, this pilot that assessed uh, whether the app was working or not, were published um, here in this paper uh, several months ago. So um, Radar COVID, uh, the contact tracing, the Spanish contact tracing app was a project which was led by the Secretary, Secretary of State of Digitalization. And their wish list and their conditions were, was the following. So they, they wanted to build an app which by, by, by design was privacy preserving. And in particular, they, they needed to, they wanted to implement something similar to what is called the DP3T protocol developed by, by Troncoso and collaborators at EPFL. Then there was a kind of technological barrier and that's important to say um, uh, in the few months after March, 2020, when the pandemic started, uh, we observed, well, we, uh, several countries that tried to start, started to, to build up their own apps found out that there was a problem with, uh, in practice with the technology uh, and then uh, Apple and Google joined forces and developed their so-called exposure not notification protocol. It's something which is embedded in, directly in the operating system of the, of the smartphone. And that really opened the way for, for viable apps, viable uh, contact tracing apps. By viable, I mean apps that didn't waste all of the, of, 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 of the battery or that for but apps that, that could work on the background without needing to have them open all the time, et cetera. Um, they wanted an app for the whole country, not different apps for different regions. And they wanted to app to be interoperable, meaning that uh, uh, it should be able, this app should be able to interact and, and, and with, with other apps from other countries. Uh, I should uh, remark again that uh, they insisted in, in, in this privacy by design uh, kind of approach, which uh, is, is of course uh, very important from the point of view of, of ethics, but also at the same time, it brought some kind of scientific trade-off because of course, uh, if we couldn't really collect any kind of data and if you can't collect data, you can't really use that data to, to make, um, to answer to scientific questions with them. So there was a kind of trade-off be, be, between what we could do and what, what had to be done. Uh, another requirements from a more public health perspective, we needed the app uh, to, be, uh, to have a short turnaround time. And that was found to be very important from a, an epidemiology point of view, the fact that, that the time between a person finding out that is, has been, is positive and, and uh, their contacts to be informed uh, had to be as, as small as possible for, 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 for this kind of technology to make some sense. It had to be complementary to manual contact tracing and, and Importantly, it, it had to be, or it, there was a potential to be a tool to detect contacts between strangers. So, so of course, manual contact tracing by, by, by default cannot really find those close contacts that can happen, for instance, between people that share uh, a bus together or 
they are close, very close in the gym or in a restaurant. And so, so this kind of um, transmission that can happen there could a priori be, be caught, caught by, by this kind of app, but not by manual tracing. And, and that was something we, we needed to test. Um, but for all these things that, that, that were you know, basically imposed from the beginning, we also had to check whether the technological solution that, that they were going to make would work in a realistic uh, scenario or not. So for that, we need a, a pilot study and that's where, what basically we, we did. So this is a bit of a time frame. April, May, 2020, Apple, Google released their uh, exposure notification protocol, um, which essentially um, enabled the Va the viability of, of, of this con type of uh, contact tracing or digital contract tracing app. Then uh, on June 2020, uh, the Radar COVID app uh, was uh, conceptualized. So there was a proof of concept and it was already re ready for validation. And there was a pilot design uh, in place. Then on July of that same year, the pilot was conducted in the Canary Islands. And uh, uh, with successful results, as I'm gonna show in a minute. And, and then on August of that year, the system was ready to be deployed at scale. Um, so the results of the pilot were summarized in this paper. And I, I shall say it was a truly interdisciplinary uh, effort. Uh, so this paper is, is, uh, is signed by, so Paolo is a computer scientist. Um, there are people from the, from CEA, which is the Secretary of State of Digitalization. There are uh, uh, epidemiologists. Uh, uh, there are uh, Manuela and uh, what is it? Paloma. They work in ethical AI. Uh, Miguel Hernan is an epidemiologist, and uh, Javier is a computer scientist, and Alex. Salinas, which is very well known to all of you and me, we are complexity scientists. And, and then there was a big group doing all the hard, all the hard work. So truly in the, in the disciplinary. Um, so let me guide you through this, uh, through this route, which is basically a, a summary of what the app does and what kind of information we were aiming to, to to collect or to try to infer in the pilot. So the first step always, uh, once you have the app ready is the recruitment. Uh, so we needed to build, to do a, a big communication campaign to raise awareness about the importance of downloading the app. And then after downloading the app in a controlling environment, um, we can, you could measure the, the adoption rate. It was clear. I mean, there were several theoretical studies that that um, gave us some bounds around around some bounds for the minimal adoption for the for the technology to, to have a uh, to have an effect. Um, then, uh, so we did this in the Canary Islands. Um, people were uh, well not recruited because the, it was everything was voluntary, uh, but but. Uh, there was a big communication campaign on, on the streets, and so pe many people downloaded the app, etc. So people started to interact freely, uh, and then eventually uh, we gave to a group of uh, randomly chosen people. We sent them as like a simulated infection. We simulated the fact that the, that they were infected, and we gave them the codes that then they later had to be had to introduced in the, in the app to notify or to trigger the, the notifications of those close contacts. I didn't say that while people interacted freely uh, for, a, for a few days, the, the, the smartphones were sort of seeing each other uh, via Bluetooth and, and therefore uh, there was daily a number of suspected um, close contacts or, or so-called matches that were built, getting built in, in a backend such that when eventually one person introduced a code saying, oh, I got a positive PCR, then all those people that, were, that had been in close contact 
within a few days, got their notifications saying, you have to go to, to, to a call center or a point of care because uh, someone that was close to you um, has been infected. So then we could also check the compliance to the, to the app by, by evaluating how many of those people that received you know, these simulated codes or those, those codes uh, that we gave to the people that, to which we were simulating the, infec the infection, um, how many of those actually introduced that code in the app. And by doing that, after that, we could measure how many, um, what we could measure is was on average, how many of those, how many notifications each of those codes uh, triggered. So we could ca calculate an estimation of, on average, how many notifications or how many close contacts the app can, can detect. And, there's, and then so a few other, few other uh, I would say, less important um, criteria. And the summary of, the, of our results that, the, that we measure in the experiment are here. So we found that at least 33% of, of the population adopted the, te the technology. Potentially, that was a conservative estimation. But it's, it's also true that the communication campaign that was made in the, in the pilot was very strong. Um, compliance was high. Uh, the turnaround time kind of was, was, was about 2.35 days between a simulated index case introduces a code in the app and the alerted close contacts follow up with the call center. So that's actually quite good. Um, the follow up, so the, the percentage of people that after receiving a notification actually then went to the designated point of care was very small, was just 10%, but we couldn't really uh, infer whether that was because this was just a pilot. It wasn't uh, actually real life and real infections. And uh, the two, I guess, more important with, what, with the adoption, the more important results is that the overall detection was good. Uh, the app could trace about 6.3 close contacts per index case, which was about twice as many contacts as manual contact tracers in the best case scenario could, could trace on average. And another interesting result is this about hidden detection. And we found that between 23 and 39% of exposed close contacts were uh, uh, strangers to the index case, pointing to, to the possibility of the app actually revealing those close contacts or the potential transmissions happening between people that, um, that by definition couldn't be traced manually. Okay, people uh, I know, sharing, a, in a, being very close in, in a bar while sharing a beer or being in the gym together or in a restaurant or in a concert or whatever, or in the bus or in the underground. Okay, so the results of the pilot were successful, I guess, um, that was the main message, but there was a key aspect which was that um, the adoption needed to be high enough for this to work. Because it, at the end of the day, these are peer-to-peer -peer technology. For, for, uh, for the app to work, both the person that is being infected and, the, and, its, and their close contacts, they both have to have the app. That's what is called peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. If, if, if they don't have the app, then they, this is all for nothing. So adoption was really key. And um, while it was a successful pilot, as we, uh, I think is quite well known in Spain, uh, uh, at least in Spain, not in other countries, but in Spain, uh, there was a poor adoption of the app at the national deployment scale. And here I'm showing you the statistics of the app downloads over time. Um, so that was August, 2020 when the app was released. Um, something that has to be said and I, that's my personal opinion, of course, it's, I'm, 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 I'm an independent researcher, is that uh, there was a problem of engagement from both national and regional governments. 
that's at least that's my perception. Why? Uh, first of all, a very important aspect of the app to, for the app to work is that whenever you are infected and you go to the doctor and you get a PCR test and it comes positive, that doctor has to give you a code, which is the, the, the information you have to write down in your, in your app and that code triggers then the, the notifications to, to the rest of the people that have the, the app. But it turns out that um, the health uh, systems at the autonomous communities were not actually releasing any codes, even if, if the app was already ready and, and deployed. And at the same time, uh, at the national level, the health department was not really engaging with the, with the technology itself. So as a, I don't know if as a consequence, or at least it is correlated with that, um, there was not much interest by, by the population on the app. And therefore, besides a quick uh, or an important uh, first step, then the, the interest was lost very quickly. So if, if, you, if you know that if you go to the doctor, no one will, will, will give you a code, why should we, you, you download the app? If on top of that, there is infodemics around whether this app was privacy um, threatening you or, or something or the like, then, then this is even, is even worse. So our paper got out about in January or so with the final results all polished and, and published, but still there was no promotion on, on the usefulness of the technology. Um, and it's actually, it was actually quite the contrary. It was a little bit depressing. For instance, there was this article in El País where the header of the article was the failure of the, of the, of the app because it says it, it registers less than 2% of the positive cases. Now, if you go in and read the second part, it says that a study shows that it has potential to be useful, okay? Because, because well, because of so, some of the, some of the, um, of the properties. But, 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 you know, people probably will, will only read the first, the first line. And instead of saying the app works, but for it to work, people have to download it. They, they, they summarize this into the app doesn't work and forget to say, because people have not downloaded it. So then who is to blame? I would say, those that should be promoting the app uh, substantially are, are in part, at, at least in part, uh, somehow responsible for, for the failure of, or success of the technology. And of course, there are other situations, the, the app, it's not clear how to evaluate what would be the effective impact on the epidemics. There are papers around that are trying to calibrate it, there is a famous paper in Nature in, by the Fraser Group in, in the UK that, that tries to estimate uh, that. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's still, it's still um, a matter of debate. So conclusions for project number two. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Spain provided the first experimental evidence that DigiCity works uh, in a controlled scenario uh, in worldwide. Um, we can say that this still works and can have a measurable effect. We don't know how, how big it is yet, but we, we know it, it can have an effect provided that there is a large adoption of the technology. Then uh, we, we know, I mean, our, our, these results that were then published in Nature Communications um, in January, these results were already somehow shared with a community in, uh, in July 2020 or in August 2020, but they were published in January the next year. And then they were confirmed by other groups like, like Fraser's groups in the UK or, or the group of Salate in, in Switzerland. Uh, the key problem is adoption and it, that is hugely dependent on, on communication. And so there are problems like misinformation spread. So if people think that there is a problem of privacy, they won't download the app. And so you have to fight misinformation for that. And then there was, I think, a low engagement by both the Spanish government, like the Departamento de Sanidad, Ministerio de Sanidad, and uh, the autonomous communities that eventually had the competences to, to promote this uh, and 
locally. Uh, from a strategic point of view, I, I shall say that uh, there were many network-based ideas which could not really be applied uh, in practice for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's like privacy issues or, or it was, my perception was to, it was very difficult to implement in a realistic context in almost real time, uh, innovative solutions. Some, this is some, some kind of learning curve that we have to go through, uh, uh, I guess, in, in the future. So ideas like using the grid-based matchings to raise awareness or detecting topological hubs used by, by using some kind of centrality measures in the, in the social networks uh, that uh, are emerging from the interaction between people. Uh, those are ideas that come from network science that could be used to to not only boost the effects of contact tracing apps, but eventually help reducing the need for things like country-wide lockdowns. And I really hope that in the future, not maybe, you know, this is not maybe something that has to be done uh, in, in a tactical scenario, like, like in the middle of a pandemic, but maybe between pandemics. So once, once this one is, is ending and we face, you know, in the next few years, we I really hope that these kind of ideas can start to be pursued. And definitely, complex systems is is the community that that shall lead these these ideas. Okay, how am I doing with time? I think very badly. Uh, well, we don't. We are not that. Uh... Okay. Stingy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So project number three um, is a different one, as opposed to project number one and two, which to some extent were commissioned. Um, this project was carried out independently. So uh, I joined forces with Robert Chalen, who is a medical doctor and a data scientist in Exeter, and again Ellen Brooks Pollock and, and Leon Dannon in, in Bristol. So the idea here was to um, build up a tool that could help reduce the stress on intensive care by load balancing patients. Um, so the motivation, I think it's rather straightforward. We all know that uh, during COVID-19 outbreaks, hospitals can get and have gotten overwhelmed. The problem of having an hospital overwhelmed is not only that then you can't really treat all the patients with COVID that need, for instance, uh, intensive care treatment, but you can't treat any patient at all. So if you have things like, um, I don't know, people that need major surgeries, they can't really go into surgery because uh, they are already using surgeries to populate them with intensive care patients. So that leads to the collapse of the whole health system and therefore to a cascade of, of deaths. Um, and that we've seen this on the news all on, on and on. So I'm not gonna go into, a, into more explanation there. Now, the, the interesting thing is that demand is usually heterogeneous. So collapse does not happen, for instance, in, in, the, in a whole country all at once. Um, and this is what? This is an example in the UK where we can, you, can, you can see that um, uh, there is some kind of heterogeneity. Now, this allows us to transfer patients, right? If you have a hospital network and not all hospitals are collapsed at the same time, you're, this allows us to, to make some transferring to, to cope with the collapse of individual hospitals. Or likewise, if you want to make transfer between regions. Uh, and and that, that's an idea that, that I was actually considered and because of the, of the lack of, of engagement from, from the governments, actually, there was even spontaneous or self-organized attempts to do that, um, for instance, in Madrid. Um, so the, the point though to make is that a transfer is not done with care for large uh, networks. Uh, this could do more harm than good, right? And here I'm showing a, a very basic toy model 
where you have, for instance, five hospitals, two of them are fine, they can receive patients, and three of them are overwhelmed. Okay. Um, now the question, for instance, for hospital number two, the hospital number two needs to transfer some uh, patients. Where should it transfer to? To one or to three? So locally, uh, a basic simple, uh, or, or, sorry, a basic heuristic would be, okay, I'm gonna look around and check what's the most, uh, like the emptiest hospital and I'm gonna transfer my load to, to him. And then you do that. And that's, well, that's the local stretch, which means the number of beds available, if negative available, and if positive, in excess. So number three is the most uh, available. So I, I, I transfer to number three. But then comes uh, hospital number four, who is also collapsed and cannot transfer anymore to number three, because number three is now uh, full, because it, 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 took, it took from number two, right? So if, if the hospital two had, had transferred to number one instead, then number four could have transferred to number three. And um, globally, the number of patients that could have been transferred would have been higher. All right, so, so a trivial majority heuristic rule provides most of the times a suboptimal solution. So the, the idea then, or realizing on, the, on that fact, the idea then was to set up a quick, simple and flexible load balancing model, which could be used at different levels that could find quasi-optimal configurations. And I say quasi-optimal and not optimal because our goal was not really to build up, you know, just to find like the global optimum of an optimization problem our goal was more along the lines of <clears throat> doing uh, something quick that works, that finds a decent uh, local optimum uh, in, 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 in no time, and a model uh, which was easily operational. I've never known how to say this in English, operationable optimi uh, method. So something quick and easy for, for, um, for the health system to use rather than a sophisticated mathematical concept. So it was not about doing a paper on some optimization problem, but actually using some ideas from optimization theory to develop a tool that, that works quick and fast. So that's what we did. Uh, and uh, the idea is, again, it's just load balancing. We took some ideas from, uh, some com from computer science. Uh, and the idea here is that, um, suppose that here the node, uh, so we have a hospital network. And uh, this is a node, which is an hospital, which is, is overwhelmed or will be overwhelmed soon. And uh, this, this hospital looks around and considers all the hospitals within a certain neighborhood and looks around, looks how many of them have some availability and choose, it does not go to the, to the majority rule, but choose an hospital at random, okay? And, the, and delivers a certain amount of, of patients to one of these hospitals. And you do this for every node in the network, okay? And then uh, once you do that, you compute the number of patients that you could reallocate. That would be um, uh, this, 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 this global parameter, this global cost function that we want now to maximize, right? We want to maximize the number of people that couldn't really get a treatment because the hospital where they went to was collapsed, but we could then reallocate within just one step of the algorithm so fast. Uh, um, so, so this number had to be maximal. So, and then we just use random search optimization, which was one of the simplest approaches to find uh, the optimum of the problem. So we run this problem many times in a computer and we just took uh, the, the configuration that uh, maximized this global cost function. 
Uh, so what, what kind of transfer networks did we build? So the nodes of the network were hospitals or uh, hospital um, trusts or conglomerates of, of hospitals, or they could also be regions, as you'll see in a minute in the applications. Then edges in this network uh, represent transfer feasibility. So either two nodes or two hospitals are connected by an edge because they are close, meaning that th there is a viable chance that one can take an ambulance and take the patient to out there, or otherwise because there is a possibility of, I don't know, another kind of transfer feasibility. <clears throat> so obviously the, um, the network is a tessellation. Well, this was an, uh, like a, mo a modeling approach, which was, I guess, which is rather um, sensible. Um, so we considered two, two scenarios. First, the UK. So we had access to, so in the UK, the NHS, uh, which is the health system, um, is organized into trusts. Uh, a trust is a conglomerate of hospitals, which is managed in common. Uh, and there are a total of 141 trusts in the, in the UK. And that data is, is geopositioned. Okay, so these are basically the red points here. These are the trusts. And what we did is, was to build up a, a, re, a regular geometric graph. So we basically said, okay, I'm going to connect those nodes in such a way that each um, node was connected to the four closest neighbors, closest in the sense of closing physical space. Um, so that's the transfer network. Um, that was in the UK. We also did uh, another analysis in Spain here because uh, the health system is decentralized and, and each autonomous community is independent. What we were looking at was the possibility of making uh, inter-community transfer. So suppose, for instance, I don't know, Catalonia is overwhelmed, uh, Aragon is not, maybe there could be some transfer between communities. It was, politically, it was clearly much more challenging, but still we wanted to, to consider that, that, that possibility. So we built two types of networks here. First, a contact network, where nodes are the autonomous communities and two nodes are linked if the, to each, each of the communities share a border uh, or a fully connected network. Assuming that, for instance, one could share uh, or transfer a patient from any two communities by using, for instance, the train network. Uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm living outside the Balearic Islands and also the Canary Islands because they are islands and, and the transfer was physically more challenging, unfortunately. But still, there wasn't so many cases here or so. Um, so very quickly, I'm um, running out of time now, the results. Um, so the net reduction here, this is the, basically the number of ICU patients that could be re relocated. This is a number that depended on the, of course, on the, on the pressure of each trust. So if everybody, if every trust was um, overwhelmed, there was nothing to share. If, if uh, the trust or the, the notes were, were empty, there was also nothing to share. But then there is a, in the middle, there's a maximum and we could reallocate up to 1000 beds or patients per step of the algorithm. Um, so this is a, a, um, a, a spatial representation. So as you, you maybe can spot the silhouette of the UK. So here the notes are the trusts geopositioned, the size of the nodes are, are the, the, the baseline capacity of the, of the trust, basically the number of ICU beds in a standard, in a standard situation, pre-pandemic. And the color is by the 1st of April, the, their status. So whether they, they were, they have some availability or whether they were overwhelmed, etc. So greener, better, uh, uh, darker, uh, worse in terms of being overwhelmed. So that was before load sharing, and then it was after load sharing. This is the same for the 4th of April, things were getting worse and worse in the UK. 
as you might remember, uh, and that was after. So you, as you can see, even if load sharing does not require any kind of um, surge of the capacity of any hospital, it only looks around, it only considers how to transfer locally in such a way that globally, the, the nodes are less overwhelmed. So, so we could do, a, I would say, a rather decent job in doing that. So this is a zoom around, this is around London. So on the 4th of April, uh, there were, well, many trusts and several of them were um, actually almost overwhelmed. And then after load sharing, the situation would have been very, very good. Uh, so, well, results are similar in the case of space in terms of the possibility of, of making transfer. Now, whether this is applicable in practice is, is less clear because in the UK, the health system is centralized. So there was an actual, the, the concept of hospital network actually makes sense. Whereas in Spain, since each autonomous community has its own um, health system, might make sense to um, load share within each autonomous community, but uh, and not intra, uh, sorry, inter community. But then again, we didn't have data from each autonomous community to be able to build up these networks. Uh, conclusions for this project. Um, we developed very quickly a, a simple and flexible load balancing model. Um, we could reduce it with, with this um, with this uh, model up to 1,000 patients per iteration, which uh, is kind of good because you have to remember that these are ICU patients and everyone that enters into the ICU, they know they have the 50-50 chance of, of surviving. But if they need an ICU and they, and they don't get, it, get any, they, they have a 100% chance of, of, of dying. Um, now the real challenge here was the integration and the operationalization of, of, of the technology. And that was more of a political challenge. So essentially, um, while our goal was to not make something like very fancy, mathematically speaking, but something that worked, that worked fast, and that was easy to convey to the people that uh, could really use it, we were not successful on uh, making them to use it while in, in those moments were, when it was most necessary. Um, they perceived this as too complicated. Um, yeah, I guess I, I don't have a, a clear reason why, but the perception was they were interested, but then not interested, but then it was almost if they couldn't really change the, the, the way they do things in so, so such a small time, uh, amount of time. Um, yeah, so then just some final conclusions. I've presented uh, three projects, three different tasks, three different um, approaches of complex systems to, to trying to provide some, some help in, within the pandemic with different degrees of success. Um, from my experience, I could say that doing science, in particular complexity science, which can inform policy making, um, it is indeed possible, and we were able to do that, but there needs to be a, a structure in place. There needs to be already from the beginning, uh, something, a communication channel. It's not like, we do the research in the university, we get a result, and then the ministers will listen to you uh, and, and take your advice on board. It's not working like that. At least in my experience, it doesn't work like that. That, that communication channel has to be in place already for it to work. Um, it's also important to say, I've mentioned the, the case of SPIM, which is this uh, modeling arm in the UK government. Uh, and uh, it's important to say that that advising group at the same time relies on their network of scientists. So each of the people in, in SPIEM, for instance, is a, is a, is a leading expert in uh, different aspects of mathematical epidemiology, for instance, but they don't always work 
uh, together to find a solution. So each of them have their own network, their own research group, for instance, uh, and their network of scientists where many of, much of that work is done. And then that work is put together in those spy, spying meetings. Okay, so that's something important to, to have in, in mind. Um, I would say that uh, this is, this um, structure is already in place in, uh, in the UK. Uh, I'm, I'm, I will be neutral with regard to the question of what politics do with the kind of information they get from their advising groups. So that's not our responsibility as scientists. As scientists, we only have the responsibility of presenting the science and giving the, 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 the advice from a scientific point of view, but, but not from a political point of view. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, I think this works uh, and this structure should be replicated somehow. And in particular, for instance, in Spain, we, we need to set up a countrywide center to both work, uh, well, not only tactically, but also pre-pandemically. Okay, so many of the questions, for instance, that were asked by SAGE to SPIM during the pandemic, or not many, but at least some of them were questions that could very well be approached before the pandemic or between this pandemic and the next pandemic. So that's something that, that we should really think about, or at least those people that are in the positions of being able to set up these things should think about. And this countrywide center or this institute or this um, committee or this uh, kind of spy M or et cetera should be a quick communication channel. So we should be able to implement such structure where the politicians ask the questions. There is an organism in place that translate those questions into a into a form of question that is scientifically, that we are scientifically able to respond, then the scientists do the science, and then this is fed back into, into the policymakers. And then finally, I, I want to reiterate that I think, at least in my experience, that that was the case, that complex systems can indeed provide helpful and out of the box solutions for real time assessment or, and also for, for not real time, but, but uh, <laughs> between pandemics uh, interventions, which are complementary to classical uh, mathematical modeling and public health expertise. And yeah, that's it. So thanks very much for listening. I'm sorry I went too long. Okay, thank you. It's a very nice talk, it's very different. Um, are there any questions or comments? Anything anybody would like to say? Hi, I I would like to ask uh, Lucas, uh, what about the, the implementation of rather COVID or similar applications in other countries? So in Spain has not really implemented by, by enough number of people. What about other countries? Um, yeah, so I know for instance that in the UK, because the health system is centralized, um, the very first, well, the UK was a massive failure. Uh, actually in Spain, the, the application, the a successful one was developed much, much before the UK. So that then in the UK, they had a second iteration and that second iteration was working because they, they used um, the Apple and Google protocol, etc. And then what I know is about the communication. In the UK, the very first day when the app was available, every UK citizen received in their smartphone a message from the NHS saying, please download this app. Please do so to save lives. And the very first day, all the media journals, all of them had in the, in the, in the cover the promotion of the app. And as a result, I think only during the first week of, of, the, um, of the release of the app, there were like over 12 million downloads of the, of the, the app. Uh, 
Now, other countries have suffered uh, similar situations like Spain in terms of adoption. Uh, I think adoption in Germany is, is larger than us. Then in Switzerland is about the same. So there's, I mean, in Europe, there's no massive success in terms of, of adoption. Probably because um, Europe is seen, I mean, in Europe, um, freedom, uh, I would say not very well understood concept of freedom, maybe is, 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 um, is very important. And, and probably many people consider that it is their, their choice to not download the app. And, and we, we very well respect that. And there are other countries where, where the app uh, was more successful in terms of deployment. But uh, yeah, I, I guess that that's more of a, um, I would say, it's not, it, it's not for complex system scientists to discuss that. It's more for, I don't know, I guess politicians or ethical scientists, or I don't know. But, but it's true that um, in Spain, uh, deploy, uh, um, adoption was, has been poorer than in other countries. And I think that uh, the reason is that there wasn't as much promotion as in other countries. So if you explain to the population on and on, and that information comes from a trusted party that you really need to you know, um, contribute and download a basic app and, 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 yeah, and get away with your life, people will do it, I guess. Uh, I, that's my opinion. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm sure if I have responded to your question, I'm just talking too, too long here. Any, any other questions yeah, or I, comments? I to, yeah, there, is a, there is a comment I want to make or something I want to know your opinion. One thing in which I believe that complex systems theory would have been of much help would be in the design of vaccination strategies. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have heard many times that the, one of the things about network compl uh, complex networks is that you can design an algorithm to remove nodes or to eliminate nodes such that uh, propagation or something is more or less efficient. Uh, do, are you aware of any studies in which uh, people try to, to study, to analyze which would be the best nodes, the best people to, to vaccinate first? The policy that has been followed is to vaccinate by groups of age. Mm -hmm. The eldest first, and then the youngest at the, at the last. Is that the most efficient? Uh, well, whether I don't know whether you know this or not, but you know any studies, or whether the politicians have cared about the studies mm. on how to vaccinate people such that uh, it's, it's more efficient uh, the vaccine. It's a very good question and a complex question to answer, um, because because again there are several things to to say. Um, so well, yeah, of course th th there are papers, there are papers. The problem is that they are papers and the scientific communities are very closed. Um, so, uh, oh, I, I should say that I agree in general that, that, that I mean, the, the, the choice of, of prioritizing by age and by comorbidities was as opposed to, for instance, prioritizing by, um, uh, degree, uh, between a centrality or things like that, I think uh, it's uh, safer. And I think it was the right choice. But definitely there are more um, creative ways of vaccinating. Maybe once the, let's say, 90% of the people that could die have been vaccinated, let's say once over 60s have been vaccinated, then a more complex solution to vaccinate below 50s, for instance, would make sense. And in that case, and in that sense, I was, for instance, involved in, I mean, I, we have discussed this and with Leon and, and some other colleagues, how to use, for instance, this um, household structure uh, that we worked on to use it to, 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 to investigate uh, different um, vaccination strategies. So things like, for instance, mixing groups is important. So should, shouldn't we vaccinate first those people where there, there is mixing? Uh, 
anyway. So, so there are several things to be said. So definitely we could have done better overall. Uh, not, but, but again, it, the problem is the, the question scientifically makes a lot of sense and uh, that, but it should be a, a quick communication channel. That's, you know, it could seem to us that we are close to areas like public health, but in reality, we are not that close. We are a very enclosed community. So um, we first need to be able to, you know, start by setting up this communication channel. Uh, there was a group of experts, right? Giving advice to the Ministry of Health in Spain and so on. So this group of experts, they were not aware that a better uh, vaccination strategy could have been used. So, uh, uh, there was, you said there is no channel between the sci the scientists who do the who write the papers, and the politicians taking the decisions. Yeah. So, but there was a group of experts, right? That was supposed to be scientists. Uh, yeah, they are medical doctors. Mm. I mean, they are public health experts. I, I I don't want to say too much because I I'm I'm not aware of everything. I'm, my, in my experience, for instance, simple concepts like percolation theory, which are very well uh, like intuitive to us, those are not uh, so obvious to things like public health, uh, public health scientists, for instance. So imagine the relation between, uh, I don't know, uh, vaccination strategies in, in, in complex networks and uh, the area, the area of vaccinology. So there is a big, if there is a scientific gap, imagine in, 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 in terms of, you know, a, a global pandemic where the, you know, the, the solutions tend to be more conservative. There's not much room for uh, innovative solutions. And if there is room, it is within this free settled structure where, for instance, if Sage asks to SPIM, SPIM can find some solutions, and then there is a um, like a chain, a chain of of, of uh, where the communication can be fed. It's not like I mean, you're not going to be able to contact someone in the health ministry in, in Spain saying, "Look, I have a paper that says this, that says that that you shouldn't vaccinate the 50s. You should vaccinate those people." Uh, that uh, live with at the same time with elderly and uh, with a child because they are the really problematic ones to you know transfer between between different age cohorts etc i don't think it's realistic no i think we have failed there it, 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 can I, I don't know but there's also a political dimension to it right not everything that makes sense is politically viable right so you if you say <clears throat> we want to vaccinate people who live with a lot of other people for example that's a certain part of the population that may not have the nationality of the country concerned right let me put it this way and that would yeah. politically be difficult to implement right although it would make sense perhaps right mm. the, have, have you encountered that kind of that, um, that it's it, you know something is considered as you know, this is the you know something one would advise from a neutral, politically neutral point of view. But politicians mm -hmm. say, "Well, you know. I, I I haven't <laughs> been exposed to the, to that kind of decisions myself because I'm I was I was yeah. not part of yeah. of, of SPIM. I, I was only working with right, right. people. Um, what I know though uh, from conversations is that um, there was no any kind of pressure from the so basically. The scientists made the science and gave the scientific evidence. And they did, didn't do more than that. They, they presented the evidence, at least that's what, what they've told me. They presented the evidence as, as is, and, now, and then the politicians had to make their own decisions. Now, of course, um, we could complain about the politicians. I mean, none of us here have are, are neutral politically speaking. So, so there are things which are politically based ideologically. There are other factual things about how a, a government can screw up stuff, uh, which is maybe more factual. 
But what I know is that, um, at least for instance in the UK, um, and that's, I think, a, a good lesson, um, scientists were not supposed to tell the government what to do. They were only supposed to, to give the evidence. And it was for politicians to decide. And that's, for instance, it's, it's, it's perceived differently in other countries. You know, uh, I think there's a debate that we might have to have, by we, we mean scientists, is whether we should tell the politicians what to do. And I, I don't think we are entitled to that because we don't have the responsibility. We only have, we think we have the facts yeah. and, 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 and um, yeah, the tools to, to decide what is wise, but eventually we only have that based on our models and assumptions. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So we have sort of, it's 10 to four, right? So we, we have to close soon, I think. Is there, is there any final urgent question that we should ask Lucas or? I have a question about, about the app. So in principle, okay. the app is, is deterministic. So you have a, a content and then you, you, you write a message to all the people that, uh, you have a positive and then you write a message to all the people that were having a contact with that person. But imagine that we are in a, in a, in a moment where we have a very high incidence and then you detect uh, a, massive event, uh, a massive event where many, many people were in contact. So wouldn't it be helpful to have some stoch stochasticity there to like uh, tell some people randomly in, in these massive events to go to take a test? Why, why, what would you get from that stochasticity? I mean, shouldn't you inform to everybody who has been in close contact? Well, at least you can confirm if there are some positives there before uh, before waiting for really having a positive and, and then you, you trace it, you, you can do it earlier. Well, the, th the thing is that all these apps are so privacy protecting that even if you detect, I mean, you, only the people that receive the information they have been exposed will know that. So there's no like big eye saying, oh, there has been, you know, a breakout of, I don't know, like, like it happened in Mallorca, like 2000, 2000 people, only those 2000 people will know about that. So that information cannot be fed as it is right now with the app cannot be fed up fed, um, into the government such that the government then say, oh, there has been a problem here, then let's, let's make a, uh, a cribado, no? like, like, a, like, a, like a screening of, of you know, all these, all these people, because uh, the app does not geolocalize anything. So you, yeah, can't really... you don't need to do in principle. So you have, uh, you observe an event where you observe 300 people having uh, 50 contacts in a day. And then you, you say, oh, yeah, this is, there, there is something weird here. So yeah, but, but you, the, thing is, start it, like the thing is that you don't observe that. So, so there's no, as I said, I mean, as it is designed right now, it's only the users that get the message that, that learn they have been positive. There's no general server where all this information is collected. Only if those people then reveal that they have been exposed, then it, it shows up. And yes, then in that case, of course, I mean, once uh, those people go to the doctor and, and get a PCR test that shows positive, then in that case, a big screening can be done. So in that case, to, to flag up that something is work is, 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 you know, is happening, uh, it's, it's a good, also it's a good, um, good uh, technology. So that means that you cannot measure. Sorry, 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 sorry but, we, but, but we, have, we have to close. I, I'm sorry, yes. but it, it, we have... <laughs> You can, but you can you can speak to Lucas separately, maybe, if okay. if you don't mind, because we are close to four, and maybe some people have other things at four and they need a break. <laughs> um, okay, so let's thank Lucas again, and uh, anybody who would like to speak to Lucas, he he's around, so he, you can you can find him um, in Office One Hundred Three B, I believe. Um,
Uh, okay, so thank you again. Thanks everybody for coming and see you uh, see you next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.